Oh. Oh. Thank you so much. Thank you, and everyone. <laughs> thank you so much for coming out. This is a huge turnout, and uh, really honored to have a special guest tonight with us at UC Santa Barbara, the director and writer of this film, Walid Moannes. Uh, this is a special honor for us here at the Carsey Wolf Center and co-sponsored by the Orfala Center here because this is the uh, advanced premiere screening for the US release of this film, um, much delayed for, from COVID and pandemic uh, delays, but we're so glad to have the film here tonight. Also, it was very special that the US release actually happens at this moment, because this is um, exactly the 40th anniversary since the invasion, you know, 1982 to 2022. Um, this film was actually shot in the school where Walid was a young boy student in 1982. Is actually the classroom that is a almost a character in this film is his classroom, right? It was. So um, I know I had the honor to see this film. Um, just before the pandemic, at the, in actually my last uh, trip before the pandemic to, was to a film festival to see this film. And I have to say that seeing this film again now at this moment, when it's finally being released in the United States, and after we've been through being teachers in the classroom during a pandemic, during such a difficult couple of years, um, in the middle of another invasion and war happening right now in the world, and I tell you, seeing this film again now was, was even more powerful and really has affected me um, on a level uh, that exceeds even the first spectacular viewing. So, so thank you, Walid, for making this film, for what it captures in terms of the history of warfare, but more importantly, how it gives us a glimpse of of humanity and of the civilian population and of the universal experience of conflict from a position that's not the battlefront. We all know Hollywood has made its, its, its stars and its Oscars and its millions depicting heroic soldiers in battle and, and um, romanticizing war, but this film, I think, by taking us away from the battlefield and putting us into the, the classroom, um, has given us a way to grapple with conflict on a, on a very different level. And I think your film is so unique in that allows us to feel the experience of war maybe even more powerfully than if we were plunged into a typical genre film on the front lines um, amongst the macho characters of soldiers um, battling it out. So I, could, I really felt it this time. I think the first time I saw it, I was more thinking along with the, the teacher with, um, and, and seeing it through her eyes. But something about the past couple of years, I was absolutely one of the, one of the children this time. I was just spellbound um, by the experience. So um, I wanted to uh, chat with you about a few of the uh, unique aspects of the film and also its, its relevance and its context. You, have so much personal experience that's poured into this film and that makes it so beautiful for all of us. Um, so, you know, I'll, uh, <laughs> but, but first, you know, how are you feeling about the film at this moment when you're about to release it in the US? Before, before uh, first of all, I really want to say how honored I am to be presenting this film here. Thank you so much. Thank you to the Australia Center. And uh, it's really, Thank you, and, and it really means a lot that this film is shown in this context and in the context of the conversation that is very important, uh, the context of peace and the context of humanity. Uh, how do I feel about the film coming out? My God, I, at one point I almost gave up hope of this film coming out in theaters because of the pandemic. We had, we, we had a beautiful start at the Toronto Film Festival where um, and then the pandemic hit, <laughs> and then, and then we thought that that was it. Um, and uh, it means the world because when you make a film like this, like you don't make the film. I made the film really for the Lebanese people um, and to, for us to see ourselves in a film. By the same token, I made this film for the rest of the world to see us in the same way that 
that they see themselves. Because at the end of the day, what this film really centers about humanity, and it really shows how alike we are. This 1982 for me as a kid was what, the equivalent of a September 11th in the United States, is the equivalent of what kids experience nowadays in the pandemic, though it's a very different kind of experience. So this is a film about the desire to live and to find normalcy in the midst of the absolute abnormalcy, which we see in every war in every country in the world. And for this film to play in the US now and to open and to reach this audience in what is my adopted home, I've been here for 20 something years now, uh, it means the world because I'm hoping that this message of humanity kind of comes across and reaches and creates conversations. Thank you. Spectacular. No, thank you. So let's focus a little bit on that question of the, you know, the, the role of, of the children and the unique perspective they have in this film. Because I think that uh, in many of the awards that you've won, the appeal to young audiences has been um, a surprise, has been, has been across the board an incredible um, trend in terms of in, in France, young audiences came out in droves to see the film and it won the uh, Young Cinema Award at Cannes. Um, you know, you said that at the, uh, the Cinema of War Festival, again, it won the Youth um, right. Favorite Film of the Year Award. So um, I'm wondering, what is it, why did you choose to set this story amongst children in order to give this different perspective on war? I, I, I really never gave it a thought. I just knew I had a story I wanted to tell, mm -hmm. right? And I, I just felt, and I didn't, like, having grown up in Lebanon, we don't talk a, little, a lot about war. This film creates an intergenerational discourse. This was something that was very important to me mm -hmm. because... Just a little, a little point uh, about Lebanon. Uh, our history books in schools, ever since I was a kid, they stopped at the war began. And nobody knows what happens after that. <laughs> because as we all know, history tends to be written by whoever claims to be the victorious. So, um, so there wasn't a point of reference. And for me, like my nieces and nephews do not know about this time. Me and I, my parents haven't talked about this time. I was 10. My parents and, and uh, my parents and my parents' generation is manifested in the adults in this film. Mm -hmm. And there was never this conversation between the three generations, what really happened. And this is even more pertinent today because of what's going on in Lebanon today, because we are exactly where we were and we are really afraid of sliding into these these uh, polemics that are very dangerous if someone is not aware of them. And this film is about creating awareness. I clearly aimed to present two sides, the two opposing sides in Lebanon. And those two opposing sides in Lebanon existed even within my family. And, and there was a choice, either we fight or we talk it out. I am by nature uh, a pacifist and I think there has to be a way outside of violence to discuss wars and our differences. So this is what really made the film. Uh, to your point, I didn't expect that this film would, uh, would reach and speak to young audiences around the world the way it has. I mean, the, the film is in schools in Italy. The film won the UNICEF Prize in, in Switzerland because it's about education. And at the end of the day, we all know that some of the first, the first thing to go in wars is education. And uh, somehow the young people, and I don't take the credit for this fully because I take the credit because of the kids themselves in the film, they, they present themselves so honestly. And I trusted me, they trusted me back. I, I, I trusted them, they trusted me back infinitely. And what they gave is their own truth. And I think that's why the mm -hmm. film is speaking mm -hmm. to the young audiences the way it is, so. Had you worked a lot with child actors before? And no. I know, well, <laughs> well, he did get Oscar shortlisted for an incredible short, short film, film starring a, a boy defending his family, family's chickens from His family's wolf, chickens, yeah, which exactly. Is Absolutely fantastic. It's, that's a that's a morality tale. It's a parable right. for war, actually. Right. Well. That's true. Mm. Yes. 
But this was the first major project with this so many kids. This was my first major project yeah. dealing with kids. It took mm -hmm. a lot of preparation. I spent a lot of time understanding children, understanding psychology and how to work with them. And I, I realized that the world, even I think all of us, if we go home and we have nieces and nephews who are very young uh, and just observe them, and you realize that when you're observing these kids and they don't know that you're in the room, they behave in a way that their world is complete. Mm -hmm. And the moment an adult walks into the room, even it's a minute change, but these kids really change. They, um, they suddenly feel that there's an adult in the room and they become children. But their world in and of itself for their peers is complete. And for me, this was very important in this film because there's two worlds. I mean, clearly I've, I've opted to stay more in the, in the kids' worlds because that's the world that drove the story for me. Uh, but the kids' world is completely separate from the adult world. And the way they interact was very important because the way inter they interact is, uh, is basically, it's a coming of age tale. The kids have to grow up and the moments they interact are the moments they're forced to grow up. Like what happens with Najid in the car. Yeah. When he actually asks his mother a very, very like, strong question, which is the heart of the film really. Why is it okay over there and not over here? So, yeah. yeah, I think for me, the most terrifying moment of the film is when those two worlds collide when everybody's playing soccer, soccer. right? And suddenly the, and the roar of the tanks and the yep. troop carriers coming on the yep. other side of the fence and the kids run toward towards the tanks, right? Mm -hmm. As if it's part of the game or... But well, what was interesting not. directorially, this was, uh, this, was, this was not my plan on the mm. shoot. <laughs> <laughs> like, basically... We had the tanks, you know, I mean, we had a whole, like, bunch of tanks and armies and whatnot, and they're going around this school, and it's like about, a, they have to go around, like, a major mountain to be able to come back and go back down. And then we finish shooting and everything, and then we Sam, in, as, as we're doing the scene, and there's Frozen in the soccer field, Sam's like, Walid, can I speak with you? I'm like, sure, what, what is it? He's like, we wouldn't do that. We wouldn't just stand. I'm like, what would you do? He's like, if, if we saw tanks, Passing by the school, we're going to run to the fence. We're not going to stay put. And I looked up, <laughs> and I looked at my other producer. And I'm like, okay, uh, Abla, <laughs> I think I think I want that. She's like, what do you mean? I'm like, we're going to reshoot the scene and we're going to do exactly what we Sam said they would do, because at the end of the day, I had to take cue from their truth, not from my truth. Mm. And I kept reminding myself of that yeah. as I was directing these kids, and to the point that sometimes I really, most of the time. I never really gave them direction standing up. I would actually sit on the floor because I needed them to look down towards me so that they don't feel I'm an authority. Because mm -hmm. I thought if they felt I was an authority, they would not be able to be themselves. Mm. Well, very effective. Um, so one other aspect of the film that I think is really powerful and why it's so important to see it in the theater is the, the sound design, right? right? And um, you know, it's not just because the screen is bigger, but as we all experienced, right, there's Mercy. another film that's happening alongside the school storyline, and that's the, the sound the of, a sound of war, which is war is depicted almost entirely through sound, except for those brief moments of tank, tanks storming through the soccer field. But, um, and so there's, there's the soundtrack of, of the rumbling of war, which we feel more than right. we, we hear. Right which is such an incredibly visceral and terrifying experience in the audience and beautiful. Um, but also I, I picked up this time that there's no musical soundtrack at all. So there's one moment right, where the piano comes in. And so we think, okay, so here comes the musical cue to start feeling romantic about Joanna and you know, it's gonna be Joanna's theme. No, it's actually a rehearsal group practicing piano up in the high school. And so you're making a little joke about maybe directors that use overuse melancholic music. And, the, and there's no <laughs> Feirouz. There's no heroic, melancholic Lebanese Civil War music at all. Not even a glimpse in the entire film, um, which is, is so kind of brave and is so against the generic conventions of depicting Lebanon which there is a beautiful, you know, set of 
musical mm -hmm. themes that come yeah. from that period. But by not, but by using the rumbling of war as a soundtrack, by not having romantic emotional cues, you let the kids lead us, and then yeah. things like the pigeons become the soundtrack, where you kind of feel the earth itself starting to respond to the war. The, the, for me, like music is really like if we're to think. I mean, film is 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 an art, right? If you're building a tableau and you only need like so many brushstrokes of a certain color and not many brushstrokes of another, it's the same thing. Every layer in this film has mm -hmm. its own purpose, and yes, it was. For me, uh, to be quite honest, I mean, there was a point of, okay, we finished the edit, we sent it over to a composer, and he's like, I want to put music there, 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 there. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, this might be too much, but let's see what you come up with. And what's interesting for me is it's really important that music is a part of the story and not necessarily an emotional driver of the story. And I just felt that what the actors did in this film was so beautiful that I, I actually felt if I put music, I would actually be robbing them of mm -hmm. their truth. Like, and try it. And I, I wanted to test the audience. I know sometimes it's a bit difficult, but, <clears throat> but yeah, I wanted the audience to actually be inside of these characters and with these characters without me trying to mediate it. Uh, I, of course, asked myself, I'm like, will I succeed in creating this empathy without music driving it? Mm -hmm. And 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 the response that I've had after when we premiered the film the first time, the emotional response of the audience was so immense that I really felt I did the right thing. It was some people during the post production told me, "Well, you need to have more music in this film." I'm like, "I'm open. Tell me where." Mm -hmm. And then you know, even with the team, open. Tell me where. And I just felt like that the moments of music were complementary to 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 what was going on in the story mm -hmm. rather than uh, drivers of the story. And this is always a battle. Like I've seen films completely be driven by music, but then you take out the music, there's almost no film. No, no. Yeah. And film is an emotional medium. If you achieve this emotional depth without music, because it's like reading a book, it's literature at the end mm -hmm. of the day. I think this is probably the first war film ever made that does not have a cello solo at some point. <laughs> That's like because you, I had let's a, check it. I'm sure, I had, I I had a fantastic case. composer. I mean, Nadim Mishlawi, he's, he's very funny. Like, mm -hmm. like a lot of people were like, why did you choose to work with Nadim? He doesn't have a very huge repertoire of work, mm -hmm. but it was a very, but he was just so, he searched mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. He looked a lot because what I was asking for was something simple mm -hmm. yet complex beautiful yet real mm -hmm. and something that doesn't upstage the narrative right um so two other aspects of the sound which i think are so important and maybe underappreciated is um one you know i think your film shows us that long before the age of saturation by social media and cable news mm -hmm. that you could have this multiple oh, yeah. conflicting constant barrage of, of information and news. So you have, you know, the radio playing in the background, the radio held by, mm -hmm. you know, the kind of leftist professor, and yeah. then the telephone calls, telephone calls, telephone calls, which we never hear the other side of the phone call, Correct. which I'm sure some people probably told you to let us hear what yeah. the parents are saying. But to me, that gives it this, again, very contemporary feel of the kind of, you know, this, this, parallel warfare of information coming at from all angles. It, it was, I mean, let's, I mean, we're to talk about like, just to be, like their sources of propaganda, right? Right. So today we have like a million web pages and a million Twitters and all of that. And in, that, in the past we used to have, everybody used to listen to radio stations and they used to know where to go to listen to radio stations. And there mm -hmm. were radio stations that literally had completely opposing narratives. Uh, one thing that I would say about this, and it's a choice that I had to make, um, is the radio in this, in this uh, the radio was constructed um, mm. very, very specifically and with a lot of research, oh. uh, with uh, a, a really incredible researcher and journalist and scholar in Lebanon. Her name is Sahar Mandour. Oh. And we spent hours and days researching and figuring out exactly what's said, following mm. almost the minute by minute of that day of what happens. 
and the two radios, I mean, it's very hard to put them because there's so much dialogue going on a lot of times when there's the radio, so you couldn't translate all of it. Mm -hmm. But for a Lebanese person, they hear the opposing point of views of these radio yeah. stations. And you do get that. That's another layer that's very difficult to, trans to transmit unless mm -hmm. on paper. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there was a moment when Ali, uh, when Mrs. Layla loses, loses it, yeah. and, and when she yells and she just kind of sits down. Basically, that's the moment when Sabra and Shatila were first bombed. That's oh the moment. God. Like, it's, it's said, it's very remote. And I was wondering. Oh, I didn't hear that. I'm like, where do I want to bring it? Do I want, where do I want the audience to be emotionally? Mm -hmm. The audience, I wanted them to be with her. On a second viewing, perhaps you get yeah. more of this. The bombing of the Palestinian yeah. refugee yeah. camps. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, it's amazing. I thought those were archive radio. No, they're, so they're, those are, that was reconstructed. One thing that happened in Lebanon during the war, unfortunately, is the opposing factions would destroy each other's archives. Oh God, yeah. Like none of, like all the left, all the Palestinian radio stations don't have any archives left because they were bombed during right. the invasion. So it's very interesting. Like it's like there's a whole thing which is a sad reality in Lebanon. A lot of the archives have disappeared. And part of it is because a lot of it would have been incriminating. Mm -hmm. And so nobody wanted to keep a record of it because to this day, there's never been really reparations and reconciliation between the different factions. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Wow, so it is it's a reconstruction of the archive, literally yeah. on, on the sound. Yeah. So a couple other points to focus on the sound for some reason, because I think it's so much a part of the experience is your use of very s almost silent um, sounds to convey the feelings of the children like you know for someone the pencils the, pencil, the yeah. pencils everywhere you hear the pencil scratching you hear the it's like a code language and of course um with sam is is drawing by scratching with the yeah. colored pencils in the sky drawing the sky drawing the transformers robots and and then of course the, what i love so much is the the pigeons and their cool. cooing so the scratching and the cooing kind of fills up, and I'm so glad you didn't have music to drown that out. Um, but I think that's, you know, it's kind of a, an amazing window into, you know, the subconscious or the anxiety or register. Or it's, it's, it's also sort of like those sounds are actually sounds that really, we don't realize it, but do take us back. Mm -hmm. it, they take all of us back. We've all had crushes. We've all felt the ma the the a school exam day and the yep. silence of that day and the tension of that day mm -hmm. this is something that we've all experienced and we've lived and we've so so for me it was really important to convey this mm -hmm. because what it does is yes it might be a little slow and tedious but that's really how we felt mm -hmm. and i really wanted the film to kind of feel i wanted it to take us back to that feeling that maybe at one point in our childhood we didn't like the, the, mm -hmm. the feeling of a ma of an exam day at a school when when the school is a little less populated when the school doesn't have as much activity when it's like every sound becomes a little more punctuated like mm -hmm. even when they even that the fact that there's a swim swimming team playing mm -hmm. like it's like far away but like you hear it more because mm -hmm. there's not a lot of noise there's not a lot of other noise yeah it's the tension of the silence yeah. really so. Well, I think that's one example of how this film captures the 80s without having this kind of retro, you know, like Stranger Things. Well, I mean, there is a bit of a Stranger Things to it, but, but you know, like the, just the sound of pencils on a desk yeah. or, or, of course, um, the, you know, Japanese popular culture and the Transformers and the robots making an appearance globally. And um, so I'm wondering, you know, our Santa Barbara resident Alan Parsons makes an appearance at a moment in the film and then at the end. Um, so how did you choose the figure of the, the Tigran? Transformers Tigran? and how does that hook up with the Alan Parsons song? Uh, <laughs> Eye in the Sky. Eye in the Sky, it was the, well, Eye in the Sky came out that week. So, oh, so it literally was literally, June yeah. 1980. Yes, exactly. So, Eye in the Sky is 100% period accurate for that. Mm -hmm. And I remember hearing it for the first time when it dropped in the UK on the BBC uh, top charts as a kid. 
because yeah. that's what we used to hear all of this on the shortwave. So it was, and what's really interesting about Lebanon, and this is something, is, is the pop culture. Uh, the, there's, of course, the nod to Blue Lagoon and, and, and the love and all of that, and this is sort of the pop culture thing. Even at the time when there wasn't an internet, if a song dropped anywhere in the US and the UK, it was in Lebanon within five minutes. It was crazy. <laughs> Something was unbelievable about the resilience and the, the determination to stay, remain connected to the world in that country. Uh, Tigran. Tigran, when we were kids, every Wednesday night, we used to watch this anime TV show mm -hmm. called um, Grandizer. Uh, and Grandizer for us was a hero. We waited for him every week. We watched him. And I used to be one of these kids that drew a lot. I was never really good at drawing. So I was literally Wissam because he wasn't very good. <laughs> so, so, but, he, but uh, and I did get into a lot of trouble, similarly. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah. So for some, like, it just, that's part of, that comes really from my obsession with Grandizer when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. and uh, and the fact that I wanted to create my own so and uh, and with regards to how I integrated it into the story it's like as kids at, at 11 I mean nothing will stop you from imagining you know it's the, mm -hmm. it's the age when we can most imagine and when we feel when kids actually feel that everything is possible mm -hmm. and in this case it just had to manifest into that. It's uh -huh. a coming of age, but it's at the end, it's a choice between growing up or imagining yeah. the hero that's going to come and save the day. And I, and I think the ending of the film has very mixed feelings because a part of it is very uplifting while a part of it is very confounding. Uh -huh. And this is life. Uh -huh. Well, to tie it in um, a bit to the long arc of your career here, um, so uh, Walid is also very known for music video directing and producing, um, directed or produced music videos for David Bowie, Miley Cyrus, Britney Spears, and this has a recent one a few months ago for Lady Gaga that has you know 80 million views on YouTube. So I'm wondering, as someone who has a long experience in music video direction, what are some of the stylistic or cinematographic lessons you took from that and applied to the film, or was this a radical shift in your technique? I mean, music videos is kind of a different, a different field. It's actually a very open field. Uh, primarily, my work in music videos is producing and creative producing. I work with incredible minds. I would say that I've done, I don't know, over 100, even more maybe. Uh, but I am sort of the result of a lot of this. Uh, and the work here that you see is a result of a lot of this. And uh, particularly, like, like, I would say the last part of the film is the music video part of me, <laughs> really, because it's sort of like music videos are sort of a, a blank canvas where you're not restricted and directors can take complete license. In films, we don't have the freedom to take as much license because we're bound to a narrative. And it was the place where I actually felt I had to liberate the film and liberating the film into this realm that's almost like a music video, which also is very satisfying. And for the viewer who's watching this film, having gone through this intensity, it is really a relief moment mm -hmm. when, when you kind of suddenly for, are, are completely in the kid's imagination. And, and I, I, I'm letting you enjoy this. I mean, this was very important. For, like, this is my music video moment. Mm -hmm. If I'm mm -hmm. to, to pull it from my, you know, it was the freest moment in the film. Mm -hmm. You know, and the audience, I think, felt it. So. Absolutely. Yeah. So are there any particular uh, reactions in Q&A sessions um, that you found really helpful and that have been really unusual in your experience now that you've done a few oh, of God. these talks? <laughs> That's a tough question. Well, just no, you know, thinking of, I know you, you're so good at these Q&A sessions. Are there, is there something memorable or moving at one of these sessions? Or Well, I mean, I yeah. Oh my God, that, that's, there's so many. I mean, I've been very, <laughs> I've been very fortunate. I've had Q and A's with very different generations and different people. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I would say, 
they've ranged everything from the very political, where I'm being mm -hmm. expected to, to come up with a solution for the Middle East crisis. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, um, <laughs> you know, uh, to, to really a completely humanist standpoint, to my favorite Q&A was in Qatar at a festival called Generations, mm -hmm. which is Ajiyad. And they decided to program the film for 8 to 12 year olds. Hmm. And I'm like, what? <laughs> 8 to 12 year olds? <laughs> and, and the programmer, she came to me, she's like, well, he'd like, trust me. They know how to read films better than you and I can. And so, so and they invited both me and Wissam. Oh, wow. Yes. And, and so, of course, all the girls had crushes on Wissam. <laughs> and it was, it, was, it was hilarious because the questions, the, the kids, the questions that we were asked and the conversation was about made me realize that these kids saw themselves in this film. And, and I was surprised because I didn't know what to expect. And, and they, read, they read the film so completely mm. differently than the adults read the film. And this is what's, what is a bigger reward because then when they have conversations, they all, everybody who's seen this film with their parents, they, in Lebanon in particular, they ask their parents, what happened? Tell us, tell us more, tell us more, we want to know. And the other, so that, that was like a very, like there was, there were, there were, I mean, I would be walking in the festival in Ajial and there was this girl who walked up to me and told me a, a secret. She's like, can I tell you a secret? I'm <laughs> sure she was telling me about a crush she had. And she was like, mine. I'm like, okay, this is, you know, because she felt like she, she was able to trust. Yeah. And then another thing is a lot of Lebanese people have left Lebanon, right? We've left Lebanon because Lebanon is tough, whether we like it or not. It's a very tough place to be. And some people during the war left Lebanon never ever wanting to look back. And these people have kids who have grown up knowing that their parents are from Lebanon, but the parents refuse to speak with them. Mm. An example was in Toronto at the film festival. I had two twin siblings, two twin sisters. They came down and spoke to me after the film. And they brought me to tears, honestly, because they, they first of all, they were completely emotional and they were thankful. And they said, oh, we've been trying to get our parents to tell us about Lebanon. They don't even want us to see this film. And we're glad we, see this, we, we just saw this film because for the first time we think we understand them. Mm. So when someone tells you this as a filmmaker or as a storyteller or as a novelist or anything, when something speaks to an audience, a viewer, to that level, for me, it was, it was the most moving thing because it means that the film is speaking and the film is, is raising the questions. And then also at War on Screen, which was in France, people, uh, the audience had nothing to do with anything Lebanese. It was the jury, the st we won the student jury prize there. It was for uh, 18 to 23 or 24 year old jury. And it was comprised, I think, of about 20 students. Uh, and they awarded the film in their, in, their, in their talk. They were like, they went home and they all got on Google to see what happened in 1982. Because the most important thing about moving forward is to talk about the past and what happened and talk about it wisely with a perspective so you're able to move forward. So mm -hmm. that's... Fantastic. So to cycle back around to Lebanon today, um, didn't want to start with that because I didn't want to launch into, you know, a dual lecture on Lebanon. But, um, you know, today is a really important moment in Lebanon um, after uh, three or four years of intense struggle, you know, in 2018-19, there was a revolutionary movement led by young people against the sectarian system, system that is kind of depicted, you know, literally separating the children to one side or the other at the end of the film, the sectarian system asserting itself. Um, and, of, and of course, that those uprisings um, successful in creating a new discourse and a new process, but in the end could not dislodge the uh, government. Um, there was, of course, the terrible blast in mm -hmm. the port. Is that 2019 now? 20. 20. Um, in the middle which of COVID. destroyed a lot of, uh, speaking of the windows being closed, right? The most immediate effect was all the windows 
across all of Beirut blew out and killed so many people. Um, and then Monday, just uh, a few days from now, there's elections in mm -hmm. Lebanon in which, again, we have uh, young people and, and folks trying to create an alternative to sectarian order running again in a time in which we, Lebanon has more refugees per capita than any, than country, any country in the world. Still, um, Syrian, Palestinian. Um, so this film s captures a moment 40 years ago, which is also very much the moment today. today. Um, how are Lebanese audiences responding to this film in Unf this context? Unfortunately, Lebanese audiences have not experienced this film the way we've experienced it today, mm -hmm. to this day. Uh, the film came out in COVID and uh, our distributor put it out in, during COVID and nobody, of course, went to see the film. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and those who have seen it, mm -hmm. few who have seen it, uh, I mean, it kind of breaks their hearts because it made a whole generation realize that we're exactly where we were 20, mm -hmm. 40 years ago, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And, and there was an event that was very sad, that was very heartbreaking, that happened only like a few months ago. I wake up to my, to my phone blowing up with like, it's 1982 all over again. Mm -hmm. Apparently there was a skirmish between two parties in Lebanon mm -hmm. around a school, in the middle of a school day where there was like fire, like they were firing on each other in the neighborhood and, mm -hmm. and bullets were flying into a school and then the kids had to, had to hide. And like, like, and this is like now my generation and their kids. And it was just like heartbreaking. It just makes you realize that we haven't learned. You know, the question is, are we allowed to learn from our past? Maybe the reason our history has not been written is because we are really not allowed to learn. Mm -hmm. So it's like there's a psycho there's psychological rejection of learning from our past or it's an imposed miseducation. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's sort of, it's, it's really, where Lebanon is today is heartbreaking. By the same token, there's a generation in Lebanon right now that's really, really trying to make a difference. Mm -hmm. and, and that generation is unfortunately described by my generation <laughs> as these people who do not know what they're doing, mm -hmm. you know, which is of course, but at the end of the day, the young people have hope and they have the capacity to build. And it seems, it seems the, old, the, the governing generation only has the capacity to destroy and continue the... Anyway, so mm -hmm. that's, that's a heartbreaking subject. Right. But we're hopeful. But the, the mobilization never it's, seems to stop. And exactly. It's, and it's this is the new generation, generation. And we really hope that they, they start making a difference. And they're really trying to do it peacefully. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a lot of forces in Lebanon that are trying to reimpose a war somehow or a, 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 a fracturing of, 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 the, of what I would say a truce. Uh, the young generation is really not having it and they realize, like, no, mm -hmm. we are not going back to what our parents went through. But the thing is, we need to allow them to do that. Right. Yeah. The claim for a civil state, which means mm -hmm. not a sectarian state, mm -hmm. but civil meaning mm -hmm. civilian, not military or Correct. militia based Correct. state. Yeah. So thank you so much. So now we'll have some questions from the audience. And Emily, if you can uh, select some questions, please yeah. raise your hand. Um, hi, Walid. Um, Hello. I want to say thank you, first of all, before I pose my question. Um, for making the only film I've ever seen that depicts my childhood in Lebanon around, uh, around that time. It's, it was an amazing experience, so thank you. I thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, actually, um, when you mentioned uh, your, um, your sojourn in, in Qatar, uh, I'm curious to know, um, because um, I'm one of those Lebanese American parents who has kids who I've tried to talk to them about my experiences in the war back then, but um, I can't somehow uh, bring it down to their language, right? Because my instinct as an academic is mm -hmm. to explain all the nuances, which, as you know, would make anyone go crazy. Yep. Uh, never mind kids. Um, so, um, how effective is a movie like yours, you think? Um, to um, inform kids like my kids 
uh, um, to give them a sense, give them a, 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 a taste of, the, of what that time was like for us when we were kids, right? Uh, so what I'm asking, I guess, is the movie obviously resonated strongly mm -hmm. with me because I lived that. But someone who hasn't lived through that psychology of war, in your experience, um, would they, um, would they, would they experience it? Would, would they experience anything like, like what I experienced? This is a very interesting question. I, I don't know that anybody can experience anything exactly the same, the same way as, as, as we've experienced it who have lived through it. But what's fascinating for me is uh, during COVID, the film played at a festival in Italy. Uh, and the festival is for kids. And, and when it played for that festival in kids, part the, after the festival ended, two organizations in Italy came and they licensed the film specifically for schools. And uh, there was eight to 14. So, and I was having, during COVID, Zoom calls with these kids who are mm -hmm. watching the film in their homes, like from age eight to 14. And it was fascinating because they related to the film, they understood the film, they understood the emotions of the film, they understood who we were. Maybe they didn't necessarily feel the war that we felt, but they understood it. It did something to them and it spoke to them. And for me, it was, it was such an, it was very, it was quite unexpected and amazing. I mean, the film is still in schools in Italy right now and it's being licensed for schools in Germany. And it already, when it was in Switzerland, uh, it was also at a festival for kids and it was awarded the UNICEF award because the film addresses the rights of children in a way. So somehow it's speaking to, to kids who have not gone through this. And I saw <laughs> something fascinating that was sent to me by one of these pro programs where it's like the questions and the discussions for different classes that the teachers are sending to the students and that the students have to respond to about how they saw different situations. And the questions that are going to the younger students are actually simpler because the, the, the young narrative in the film is very simple. It's very clear, it's very simple, and they get it. And what's interesting is that the kids see maybe a deeper nuance in that because they project their own emotions towards each other when they watch the film. So. Does that make sense? So somehow the film is doing that. Had I known that it was going to transcend to that level? Honestly, no. This, this is a gift for me. And I think this film has become sort of a gift in terms of, in terms of this kind of education. So, so I feel very blessed with that. Fantastic. Yeah. Pleasure. Um, fantastic film. Amazing. Thank you. Uh, very touching. Uh, there's a scene towards the end uh, where there's music blurting out of a car radio. And then she, you know, she finds it. And what, what's, is there symbolism there? Uh, this is a very, very well-known, uh, what we call a mawil. It's a very Lebanese thing. And actually, the radio that was playing through there is the Radio Monte Carlo, which was a radio that we listened to very, very much. Basically. Uh, it was a moment that I felt was necessary, honestly, in that film and in that context, because symbolism, I don't necessarily believe in symbolism because some things just spoke to me. And, and it was, uh, I know I was talking to Aliyah and I'm like, I, you know, and we discussed what it is that she listened to and all of that. And I don't know. I just felt like it was necessary because that mawal in particular is a very, very Lebanese thing. And for her to switch off the radio and shut the door at that moment for me was very powerful. Like sometimes you can't put your finger on something, but you know the feeling of it. This was that. Yeah. And the car was empty, so it, exactly. it seemed like life was being shut exactly. off. Yeah. Exactly. With the door left open and the yeah. father off looking for his daughters. Yeah. Yeah. I really appreciated how you've talked about the different receptions between the younger generations, the older de generations, both in Lebanon and abroad. I was curious what you thought about the next generation of Lebanese filmmakers, the younger filmmakers. Do you feel like they 
um, are focusing more on dissecting the past and looking in the past or more speaking their truth, as you were saying, about the future? Or a little uh, bit of both, I a guess. Little bit, a little bit of both. I think there's a whole new bureau. Th there's some incredible work that's coming out of Lebanon right now with cinema. I mean, we had, uh, yeah, there's, there's some really, there's, the young generation seems to be dealing with quite a lot of contemporary issues. Like for me, this is my, so this is obviously 1982 is a period that I really wanted to address. My next project is going to be contemporary. Seeing some of the, the films that are coming out of Lebanon right now that opened in Venice actually and in Cannes this past year, uh, they're my peers and they are addressing contemporary issues and they are doing it quite beautifully actually so and very bravely so and on every level yeah you. you're welcome <coughs> hello um very beautiful film um i just had a quick question um what was or can you explain the symbolism of the pigeons like they seem to be a very prominent part of the film so i was just curious what your take was on those <laughs> um Keep the mic with her, please. Can, can she keep the, hold on to the mic? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, would you mind telling me what you took, what your takeaway is from the pigeon? Um, well, there was a part where he was like he smiled at it, so kind of got the sense of like hope from the pigeons, mm -hmm. or like I don't know, they flew away, so maybe some type of freedom. I'm okay. not sure. All right. Um, going to feelings, I will start there. Um, I wrote the pigeons in the script, and the pigeons where existed where they are in the script are, is where they are in the film, and no, none of my producers took the pigeons seriously when I was ready to shoot. They thought I was kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, no. They're like, are you serious? You want pigeons? On I'm like, yes. So uh, there's something about, and this goes back to my first film as well. For me, like, I, I, I just think that, that nature has its own way of taking over. The pigeons arrive at the school. We don't know why they arrived at the school. There's a mystery to that. So the logic of the pigeons arriving at the school means they couldn't be where they usually are. Uh, so, and then the school is empty at the end, and then the pigeons are inside the school and the students are gone. The students, the pigeons' lives and their sky has also been taken over by aircraft. The first thing you see, one of the first shots you see in the film is you see the, the pigeons flying through the sky and almost in formation. It's kind of echoes a little bit the Pink Floyd, uh, the wall thing. Uh, so it's sort of, there were just feelings that just happened. And for me, the pigeons form, kind of embody the man versus nature, how we tend to impact nature and how nature will try to take over whenever we can't or whenever we leave. And it's, uh, it's a feeling. The literal, the literal story of the pigeons is, these are homing pigeons and Lebanon is full of homing pigeons. And if, a, if they lose their rooftop, they're trying to find another place to be. So they are a metaphor, not only, f they're basically a metaphor for displacement. So. All right, thank you. Yep. Good. So thank you very much, Waleed. This is incredible. Please uh, stay with us and chat afterwards. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Really amazing. Thank you. <laughs>